this week on The Startup Life. In any any sort of organization, even if you're if you're an entrepreneur, so it's just yourself, maybe you have a co-founder, but in large organizations, uh, typically the way things work is there are small teams and there's the, what people sometimes call the entrepreneur. All right, Startup Nation, so let's take flight with Samuel Morheim, founder of VantageIO.com. The Startup Life begins now. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. Hey, Startup Nation. Do you enjoy the startup life? Now you can let the world know with gear from the show. Choose from the label yourself, make your own look, and making money t-shirts to tell your story of your path of entrepreneurship. Click the link in the show notes to purchase. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. We got a big time guest in the building out of Miami, Florida. We got Samuel Morkine from Vantage IO. What's going on, Sam? Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. No worries, no worries. Are you ready to pour some knowledge in the startup nation today? Yes, absolutely. Let's Looking forward to it. For sure, for sure. So first things first, this is Dominic Lawson of the Start of Life podcast, and it is powered by the Binge Podcast Network. So let's get this thing started off right, man. Tell us your origin story on your path to entrepreneurship. Well, so I, I mean, I was born in Colombia. And then um, I grew up in Colombia, in South America. I moved to Israel for about two years, where I did part of my my college, and then moved to to the States in 2000. And I've been here in 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 Miami uh, since since early 2000 and until today. Okay. And um, I've always been involved in software, uh, IT uh, management, and I did quality assurance. I did software engineering, and and finally, in the last maybe 10 years, I became CIO of a healthcare IT company where we basically develop software to manage the healthcare of patients on board cruise ships. Okay. And so I had a lot of experience in healthcare, fintech and marketing automation. And so the last few years, the last three years, I dedicated myself to helping entrepreneurs launch their startups and launch their ideas, their dreams into reality. And um, so, just to just to to sum it all up, basically that I I've been involved in several startups throughout my career. Okay. Um, I did the health IT, then I did uh, predictive analytics uh, software for social media management, and then last is the um, this so, this company that I, that I built just to help entrepreneurs with their with their startups. Got you, got you. Thank you for sharing that. And and that that you know company that he's talking about, startup nation is Vantage IO, and we'll get into that. Uh, much deeper later on in the show for sure. Thank you for sharing all of that, Sam. I appreciate that. So I want to ask you this, man, because you're down there in Miami, right? So I'm curious (laughs) what the tech culture is down there in uh, Miami. Wow. It's, it's blooming. Like you have no idea. It's uh, people probably don't know this. One of the largest startups in history. It's down here. It's it's a few miles up here. It's uh, a magic leap and they're, you know, they're a billion dollar company uh with all the augmented reality stuff so in the last few years there's been a, a huge push by the community and, and very large players moving here to make it into silicon beach or make it into the next silicon right. valley right and that we you you always need to have those those components of entrepreneurship you need to have the talent and then you also have to to have the the, the finances and everything came together the the universities are working closely with with the, the companies to to provide the talent talent is flocking in from all over the world and it's it's also a very interesting hub for many companies to just set base here because you're the middle point between south america europe um and and the, the rest of the, the states uh with a very interesting mix of cultures uh which is just unique to south florida i hear that i hear that thank you for sharing that and, and i have been kind of seeing that in south florida which is why i wanted to kind of get your take on it quick follow-up if i would what What's probably from a culture standpoint, the main, the main differentiator between Silicon Valley 
and down there in, in South Florida, as you call it, Silicon Beach, what's like the main culture difference that have you seen? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I want to talk anything bad about Silicon Valley. Oh, no, 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 of course not. No. <laughs> I mean, you, you hear the stories, like uh, everything's a little bit like, like paper money, some, some huge numbers without uh, not so much substance. Mm. Here, I, I feel there's, there's much more substance here. Uh, there's, there's more real numbers, real businesses. And um, when, you, when you get an investor on board, it's because they, they did see value. And they there's there's some revenue there's customers there's there's an uh, not not a not a spreadsheet projection but there's there's a, there's some reality to it right. so it's a little bit more I feel it's a little bit more down to earth uh, compared to what I've seen or what I heard or experienced from from Silicon Valley but overall it's just it's it's amazing there's there's all this uh, this cultural mesh that's happening here you see all the cool workings popping up everywhere. And people just loving this, this you know, the gig economy and the, and right. the startup environment that, that's happening here. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. I was kind of curious about that. And you definitely kind of helped out, you know, uh, help kind of paint the picture for me there. I appreciate that. So, yeah. Sam, I want to ask you this, man, because you wrote a piece, uh, I believe it was last summer, called, Is Your Idea for a New Mobile App Worth It? Easy Steps to Know for Sure. And one of your bullet points I found interesting was, Building on your idea is only 20% of the battle. Now, Sam, you know, here at Startup Nation, we have many people who have app ideas they want to pursue and stuff like that. So for those of us who, who have those ideas, how do we get our idea from, you know, from the ideation phase to the marketplace? Help us out a little bit. What does that look like? Wow. So, yeah, definitely. There's, there's a famous, uh, I think there's a famous quote by like Rockefeller, I think he's the one who said it. And he's like, if you were to start over again and you only had a hundred dollars, what would you do? And he said, "I'll uh, I'll spend one dollar in product and ninety nine dollars in marketing." Mm -hmm. And I think my my experience, which it's filled with um, a lot of sorrow and then some successes, gotcha. will tell me that what, whatever you you think you're going to invest in your application, you have to think that you're going to require at least ten times more just to market it. Because we, you know, we live in a very saturated uh, marketplace. Even Absolutely. though everybody thinks that, you know, it's they're they're going for a blue ocean and their idea is completely different. The, I tell people whenever they come with a, with a brand new idea, I tell them there's somebody in the world, or at least five or ten people around the world that are already doing your the same idea, and they're in some stage of of, of producing it, and they're gonna launch, you know, either a few weeks earlier, or a few months be, uh, after you do. But there's somebody doing something very, very similar. Mm. And so first of all, to, 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 you have to become extremely different uh, and solve a problem in a so unique way that you're going to be able to um, be set apart from, from the competition. And just having a better product, it's not going to get you to, to where you want to go. So the, yeah, I tell people, focus on your, your, your idea. It needs to be unique. It needs to solve a problem in a very unique way. Uh, not to say that other people aren't solving the same problem, but you probably have a different approach and it's a, a better approach. And then you need to communicate that to the world. And that's 80% that's of the battle. It's getting out there. If you, and there's, there's all these theories on if you already have a, an audience, then you build a product for them. Uh, so there's all these things. It's, it's around the same issue, which is how do you get your, your message across? How do you make yourself known? And it, it, it's a, it's a very, it's an uphill battle. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I think a, a big takeaway from Samuel's answer startup nation is that differentiation piece is so important because there's a lot of copycats out there, you know, whether it be in apps or websites or anything in between on your path to entrepreneurship, but that differentiation piece is so vital. How do you stand out in the marketplace? So Samuel, I appreciate you sharing that for sure. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, the, the very first thing is to, to, you know, be honest with yourself that, okay, so my idea, my, my problem, there's other people trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, why is it that, that it's different? Is it uh, what I call a superficial uh, differentiator or is it a more in-depth in differentiator? If you're just taking an application uh, that, you know, there's, there's an app for Android and then you say, well, I'm going to make it for iPhone and that's your big differentiator. Um, of course, that, that's not going to take you far. So you have to, to understand the, the differentiator that you're, that you're aiming for. It's enough. Uh, so there, I tell a story about PayPal uh, came out you know, 20 years ago and you would send 
money through through email. And then a few years ago, Venmo came out. I don't know if your 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 audience is familiar with Venmo. You're yes, familiar with Venmo. Very much so, so. Venmo came out. It does exactly the same thing, but it just did it so much easier. And in a way that, you know, back then it was emails. In the last few years, everybody had smartphone. So you could just download an app and send the money very easily uh, just with their phone number. And then, of course, PayPal then ended up buying Venmo because it was the same problem, just solved in a much more elegant way that that people just couldn't resist switching from PayPal to Venmo. And then, of course, PayPal, that's why they had to, to buy it. But so there has to be a lot of differentiators, not and not superficial ones. It has to be more than just your user interface. It has to be more than just everybody's doing it three clicks. You're doing it in one. Well, great. But how does that really dramatically change my life or, or the life of my business by using your application? It has to be a complete paradigm shift. Then there's other ways to, you, you can bundle it. You can bundle with services, with, your, with the whole culture and the, the whole following that maybe you build up with your application. So we hear all this applications that have a huge following. If your audience is familiar, let's say ClickFunnels. So they have, a, they have a simple app. There's 100 different applications or web apps that do the same thing as ClickFunnels, but the community and the following, it's so massive that there's so much value just in doing that, that you wouldn't dare go to with, with a competitor. You would go with ClickFunnels just because they, and I have no relations with them. I, have, <laughs> I don't represent them or, or get anything from them. Just, um, but uh, I, that's the reason why some people flock to that, to that type of application. So there, there has to be a huge differentiator in order to, to get your message across. For sure, for sure. Thank you for sharing all of that great value. And I really hope you caught that Startup Nation, especially those of you who are thinking about app development and stuff like that. So Samuel, I also want to ask you about, you know, you also wrote a piece uh, about finding great funding sources for, you know, a tech company or something like that. So what are those great funding sources? Because we have many who have great ideas, but I mean, you know, we all need funding. So what are some great ways to get funding for your tech team? Yeah, so... Definitely funding, it's, it's one of the biggest obstacles for, for most people. For sure. And the, the way I see it is like, a, like there's your inner circle and then you, you start expanding from there. So the very first thing people need to realize is that, again, you need 20% for product, 80% is going to be for, for marketing and launching unless you already have a huge audience. Uh, so there's, there's many ways. The, the, the first one is, of course, Friends and families, as one VC friend of mine told me, it was friends, families, and fools because it's a very risky investment. But if you truly believe in your idea and it's 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 a solid idea and you understand that it's going to be different and that that it has all these components to make it successful, um, then you reach out to friends, family. You you have your mortgage, you have your savings. There's there's all this internal uh, funding which it's painful, but if it works, it pays off. Then then of course there's a lot of angel investors, and you'll be surprised as to how many angel, and angel investors, is, it's a broad term, but anybody that's willing to give you 50, 100, 200K to launch your idea, and they're willing to, to, to make that huge risky investment in you, they probably don't know you. Um, and, and, and from starters, that's, that's a big risk. But once they get to know you and they see your idea and they believe in you, they'll be willing to put in that, that, that money. And the biggest Sort of the biggest obstacle that I've seen is people uh, in the last few years would be able to get funding just by showing a PowerPoint presentation and a spreadsheet projections and everything else. Uh, a lot of investors, um, especially on the on well on on all on all ranges of investment, they become more more selective and they don't want to see any more PowerPoints or or projections. They want to see real customers. They want to see a real product. Or even, I mean, they want to see something tangible. They don't want to see uh, any more drawings. And that's why on, on, with Vantage.io, we create, we typically go for the MVP. We go for the minimal viable product, which allows an entrepreneur, instead of investing 200K or, or, or more in an application, with a small upfront investment that most entrepreneurs would be able to cover themselves, they can create that MVP. They can gain their first, um, their, their, frame, their, their first customers. And with that, they can attract investment much easier, much more easier. Because, you know, let's face it, if you have an idea and you, you show it to an investor, he's willing to give you a money and there, you have zero revenue, you know, they have, they have all the control. Once you have a dollar of revenue, even if, if you're losing money, but you have revenue, you're post-revenue, right. it changes dramatically. 
So you, you have more negotiation power, you have more realistic numbers, you can at least show, okay, well, we got five customers and it doesn't matter. We only making a hundred dollars a month and we're losing 10,000, but we're making money and we were able to get those 10 customers out of the blue. So we know our idea works and it can fly and we can, we can scale it once we get that investment. So it's much easier. That's my, my biggest advice for, for entrepreneurs is build it. It's like that the whole thing about build it and they will come. You need to build something so that you can show it to customers and you can attract the, the, the investors to your, to your project. Hey, Startup Nation, I wanted to chime in real quick with a reflection point because Samuel brings up something that I thought was rather interesting. Look, on your path to entrepreneurship, Startup Nation, you're gonna wanna seek out investors and things of that nature. But the thing is, Startup Nation, when you go after angel investors or some type of investors or whatever the case may be, be mindful that the investor is more than just a purse. The investor is more than just a person that can cut you a check. Honestly, Startup Nation, keep in mind that remember, look, nobody builds anything by themselves. Nobody builds anything great by themselves. And those investors, that rule implies to investors as well, which means that they've probably had a lot of help and a lot of uh, resources at their disposal to get to their level of success they have today. And Startup Nation, instead of just looking at the check that they may provide they also may provide you with their rolodex which actually may be more valuable than the check that they can write so look when you're looking for investors and you're looking for people to kind of dive into the idea of your company and what you do keep in mind that their resources and their network are probably if not more valuable than the check that they're writing let's get back to samuel gotcha thank you for sharing all of that my last question before we shift gears, man, because like I said, we have many people who have app, have, who have app ideas and stuff like that, but they're, they're not coders. They're not like, you know, they're not IT experts or anything dealing with coding or anything under that umbrella, if you will, right? They don't have no idea. They just have an idea. So what does, uh, you know, so obviously they got to build a great team in order to have a successful app launch and everything in between. So what does a great tech or app team look like in your opinion? Like, what do you need? So you, you don't necessarily have to have the technical skills. That's, okay. that's one of the biggest skills that an entrepreneur needs to have is understanding that they don't need to know how to do something. They just need to know who to find that can do it for them. Right. So that's because otherwise you, you start um, in, into that endless loop of learning. And then people say, well, I'm going to code it myself. And I'm going to become a coder. And then two years later, they're still working on their idea. So they, you don't need to have the skills. What, what, you need to, what you need to have is a very clearly defined problem. You need to be able to explain that clearly, not just for yourself, your investors, your customers, but for your development team. So where are you going to get that, that idea, that concept needs to be clearly defined and clearly explained. This is where most entrepreneurs and most of our clients um, faces challenges because they, 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 they're pretty sure they have their idea um, clearly defined and when they say well here's my one-liner and then you, where are your requirements where's where are all the things that you're going to need to build this application from from that napkin idea all the way to a functional product it's it's nowhere to be found so the first thing is to clearly define that problem clearly define how the application it's what the application is going to do the next step is knowing how that application is going to look and the last step is the execution so the team, basically, if you're going to build it in-house, you definitely want to start with the front end. You want to make sure that somebody can actually stamp out your idea into clearly and, and beautiful design user interface and user experience streams so that you can demonstrate your idea, even if it's, again, even if it's in paper, but at least you can click through that PowerPoint presentation with a fake application, but it's clickable. At least you can demonstrate it. Right. And and so that, that's, that for me is the, the, the most critical point. It's, it's having that person that can translate your ideas into something tangible that developers can use, that your marketing team can use, and that your investors can see. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. So let's shift gears just for a little bit, Sam, if we could. So sure. I want to know who or what inspires you as an entrepreneur and why? There's definitely... Going back in, no relation, uh, the, the founder of ClickFunnels, Russell Brunson, um, okay. I, I admire him. I've been following him for, for many years, and I, I saw how he grew his business. And then 
the, the stage that he is that he's and his company is right now, it's it's impressive. I mean, he's he's a true marketer, he's a true sales genius. And mm. he managed to do this with with I mean, it it it, it, was, it wasn't it wasn't easy for him. I, I know him for I mean I don't know him personally, but I know I've been following him for many years and I know when he was starting in the middle point of the of the career of the company and the, the latest stages where, where they're in right now. They're exceeding hundreds of millions of dollars and hundred thousand active customers, and it's just impressive what what they've done. And he's still very humble and and still very hard worker, and and so I admire him for for all that. For sure, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. So Samuel, let me ask you this because I came across an article in Fast Company that featured former president of MIT Susan Hockfield, and mm-hmm. she was saying that we've hit a new era of scientific innovation in America. So Samuel, I want to ask you and get your take on this, right? So what are you seeing are the next steps in innovation, you know, in, a, in America innovation when it comes to technology from your vantage point, from what you're seeing? What's something that you're excited about the next phase of uh, innovation in America? Sure. So I think that the whole relationship between IoT, the Internet of Things, the devices, the wearables, the, mm-hmm. your, your, uh, your cameras, all those small devices that are that are starting to to pop up everywhere pair with all the predictive analytics and machine learning that we're that we're generating and that we're being able to create that we couldn't three four or five years ago and that now it's so easy for any junior developer just to start playing with those type of technologies it's it's going to create that whole new phase just like uh, in my opinion just like mobile devices and smartphones change our lives in the last 15 20 years Mm-hmm. Uh, this is this is what's going to come up for the next 10 or, or, or 20 years. It's all this integration. R- right now, the biggest challenge is it's that they're all disconnected. I mean, they're connected to the internet, but they all live in their own little world. And, and there's all that inter- intercommunication problems that are, that are starting to occur and the security issues. But let that aside, once everything starts really talking to, 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 to other devices, it's just going to be impressive, all the the advancements that we're going to be able to make and how that's going to dramatically change our lives. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. I just kind of want to get your take because, and, and I'm glad you mentioned I, you know, uh, the internet of things, because that's something that's really, you know, scaling in the past two, three years where, and I find it fascinating, right? Where you're talking about like, you know, I seen uh, instance where, like, let's say somebody broke their arm, you have a cast and now doctors can kind of see the healing process in real time. Uh, due to the internet of things and stuff like that. We yeah. actually had a past guest on here, Magnus Unimir out of Sweden, who's an AI expert. And we kind of talked about this a little bit. So I appreciate you sharing that part. I think a lot of people are kind of fascinated by the uh, the internet of things for sure. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because uh, I came across another article uh, in CNN Business, and I kind of want to get your take on it. Let me read an excerpt from that article. So the name of the article is talk about, you know, growth consumes Silicon Valley. Now it's searching for a moral compass. And an excerpt from it says, for years, tech companies pitched their products as tools for making the world a better place. Now growing number of tech veterans who are instrumental in building companies ranging from Google, Facebook, Twitter, have admitted that they, did, they didn't give enough thought to how their products could be used to do the opposite. Maybe, you know, using that power for evil. So, Samuel, I want to ask you this. Do you think uh, tech companies are kind of in search of a moral compass right now? Well, uh, that's, that's a very tricky question. Because, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we hear all the stories right now that's what's going on with Facebook, YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if, you, if your listeners know, but in the last few weeks, um, YouTube and, and Facebook have censored uh, a large number of accounts. Some yes. of them were, you were extremists, um, uh, for sure. Uh, right. But then... That extremism is is going to be on the on the eye of the beholder, I guess, right? So, right. So who 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 defines what it's too left or too right, right? right. So, um, and that's that's going to be a, a huge problem uh, moving forward. The the other day we we're listening about, I mean, people know Gmail, how they have now that predictive text, and so everything that you type in your browser, I assume it's public. I, everything that I type in my browser, regardless of where I am. Right. I always assume that it's public, especially my email. So when I, I use Gmail for everything, mm-hmm. when, when I'm typing every single keystroke, even the ones that I deleted. So if I type a word and I deleted it, Google has that word and knows that I deleted it and probably that I type it three more times. So they can analyze this for marketing purposes to sell more information, more to have more 
insights into me. But uh, later on, it can also be used for, for evil. And, and again, if, what happens if the management team in Google doesn't like my points of view? So it's, it's, a, it's a huge risk. At the same time, we, you know, I don't like to be paranoid. <laughs> so gotcha. I don't like to, to think that people are going to use this for, for evil purposes. Right. But, but yeah, there's, there's a book. I think it's called The, the Formula. Uh, I have to look it up, but I think it's called The Formula. And they talk about uh, all these algorithms and machine learning and AI that's, that's being built in into everyday things that we use. Uh, for example, uh, how they, they're using AI for uh, toll violations or how they're using AI to, to sort out case law. Uh, so when you have the attorneys and the, the paralegal teams are reading through thousands of documents, right now they're using an algorithm to read through the documents and figure out what's important to then go to court and do all, all the other stuff. Well, what happens if the developer put in some of their bias into that algorithm? Not, maybe not even on purpose. They just, right. you know, we all have biases. Right, so, for sure. Yeah. And there's, there's a case that, that they talk about there where uh, they, they use some sort of machine learning to dictate who could be released on parole and who couldn't. And first of all, they analyzed the, the parole hearings and they would realize that humans before lunch, they would grant more paroles <laughs> than after lunch. <clears throat> Just because right. they probably wanted to get quicker to, to lunch or whatever it is. But the same case being seen before lunch or after lunch would get more leniency. Now, if you put out, if you create an algorithm to do this, it would remove that bias, but it would, in, it would introduce the bias from the developers or from the management team that created that software. So it can all be spent into all these positives and negatives, but I think it ultimately is just going to make our lives so much easier when all this starts talking to each other and the machine learning kicks in and everything becomes so interconnected. It's, it's going to change our lives for good in most part. And then we always need to keep that eye on, on the, on the surveillance and uh, on the negativity. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. I guess I just kind of wanted to get your take on it because you know, the the whole cliche with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. And so sometimes things that are meant for good can kind of go the opposite direction. So I just wanted to kind of get your take on that. So I appreciate you indulging me in that a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. For sure. So quick question before we go to break, man. Entrepreneurs consider themselves lifelong learners, always engaged in constant professional development, you know, listen to podcasts, reading books. So when you hear the term professional development, what does that mean to you? And what are you learning right now? I think definitely reading. Uh, nowadays, everybody reads more than, than they think they do because, okay. you know, we're always, you know, we're connected. We're reading, even if it's Instagram, hopefully you're reading more than Instagram, but um, there's, there's all this knowledge uh, out there and um, you have to be careful with, you know, there's, there's knowledge, which is just hook to, to just buy thousands of products, but there's all this wealth of knowledge that you can just tap, you know, uh, it's, it's unlimited. You can learn, you, you can get a college degree. Maybe you don't get the certificate, but you can go through the entire education that you could get on MIT or, or Harvard or any, anywhere else. You can go online and you can go through a year or two years of reading and learning that. So that's, that's one way to do it. I do listen to a lot of podcasts. I do hear a lot of audiobooks. I don't read that many books just because I spend the whole day on, on the screen, but um, an audible junkie. So I, I, I'm always there listening to new books. And the last few months, I've been heavily involved in learning about marketing, marketing automation, more, more of that. So just marketing and sales. That has been my, my, my focus in the last few months. As an entrepreneur myself, I, I, my biggest focus is growing my company. How do I reach more people so that I can help them uh, grow their, you know, launch their startups and grow their, their, their businesses? How do I get to them? And so there's all these new ways to, to do it, anywhere from Instagram all the way through very complex uh, webinars and, and email marketing. So it's always a struggle for me to, 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 to do that. But uh, that's, that's where I am right now, just uh, a lot of marketing and sales. Got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. How you like being on the startup life so far, Samuel? Great. Yeah, very, very interesting. I'm, I'm surprised you, you read so many of my articles. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're getting great value from Samuel's content, but we got to pay a few bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson. This is the Startup Life Podcast, and it is powered by the Binge Podcast Network.
Hey business owner, the startup life reach is growing. Wouldn't you like your business to grow with it? Reach out to us to advertise on the startup life. You can reach us at 901-857-4818 or you can email me at dominic at askalsolutions.com. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like this is a great music to have break on, but wouldn't this break sound a lot better with the same music, but your business being advertised on it? Need more content from the Startup Life, you say? You can now sign up for the Startup Life All Access Pass on the Binge Podcast Network's Patreon page. There is exclusive content written by yours truly, video content where I share even more of my business philosophies, and whatever crazy content I can think of out of that crazy head of mine. And at only $5 a month, yeah, $5 a month, this is more content for you, Startup Nation, to really get ahead of your competition. So instead of upsizing that meal at your favorite fast food joint, you can now invest in yourself on your path to entrepreneurship. Click the link in the show notes to sign up. All right, Startup Nation, so let's continue. So Samuel, if you would, please, sir, tell us all about your company, Vantage IO. Sure. Let me, let me tell you a story. You, okay. have to, you have to picture this. It's, it's like two o'clock in the morning. There's, there's software developers sleeping in the floor. There's no more caffeine that can keep us awake. And we have to deliver uh, our next batch for, for a software product that we're, that we're giving. And okay. our customers are expecting this. Our investors are demanding it. And I, I think I hit um, rock bottom there. I, I knew there had to be a better way to creating software for um, you know, fast moving companies like, like we were there. And it was just frustrating that, that we just kept going through that loop or of you know, uh, late nights and, and quality issues and, and delays and everything else. And so I, was, I had a, an epiphany, I had a, a, a very lucky opportunity. One of my ex-roommates called me one day and said he wanted me to join his, his company to, to launch a new startup. And it was to do predictive analytics for social media marketing. And we had to do, of course, like any other startup, we had to do something amazing. It had to be done with precision and it had to be done very quickly. And I knew there, there was no way I was going to go through that process uh, without making dramatic changes. So with a blank slate in front of us, we re- reinvented ourselves. We recreated the process of making software for startups in a very fast and agile way. And we, we sort of created this, this new process. And 90 days later, we launched. And we, you know, three or, three or four months later, we started uh, getting Fortune 500 customers. We got investors on board. And it was successful. And that same concept now I spend the last three years applying to all the businesses, all the entrepreneurs that I that that, that I had the pleasure and the, and the honor of working with, and that's the same process that we that we put in in practice for their for their startups. How do we get them from from the napkin idea all the way to production mm-hmm. uh, in in a, the least amount of time and with precision? So whether you're in the early stages where you already have a business plan and and sort of in the middle of developing, or you're already on the uh, production stage and growing and you just want to get to the next level uh, or methodology can help you and 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 can take you to, to that next level and or main goal the reason why we do this is because I'm very passionate about startups and entrepreneurship and uh, we want to uh, basically we have our big hairy audacious goal which is to help raise one billion dollars from here until 2030 through the startups that we help build so we're on track to <laughs> doing that and the next 10 years. And this is the reason why we do this. This is why we, this is why I do this every day. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. And Samuel, you kind of told me before we started recording that you kind of wanted to offer Startup Nation something. You want to share that with us at this time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for the listeners of the Startup Nation, you can just go to vantageio.com slash the Startup Nation. And we're going to uh, put together a landing page there for you guys where you can apply for a one hour consultation of the startup technology framework assessment. And by doing this, you actually get the, your problem and the, the focus that you're, you're having for your, for your problem and your solution analyzed. We help you define how it should look. We help you define the technology, the stack that you need to use, and a roadmap so that you can actually take this and start hiring developers or hire a company uh, to, to develop this application for you. So we give you everything. At the, at the end of this hour call, you'll get all of this done for you so you can take your idea to the next level. So vantageio.com slash the startup nation. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Sammy. For, I appreciate that. We love freebies. Quick question though. Could, is it possible we can make that the startup life as opposed to the startup nation? Can we do oh, that? Um, 
I'm so sorry. The no startup. worries. No <laughs> worries. Vantachayo.com slash the startup life. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. And Startup Nation, if you look in the show notes, we have that link also as well for easy access for sure. <laughs> Sam, yeah. I appreciate that. We definitely love freebies here on the startup life for sure. Yes. So I, I want to ask you this, man, because on your website, you talk, you know, you, you've helped some amazing clients, including Revlon and 3M. So without going into specifics, because I'm pretty sure there's some privacy stuff there. How are you able to kind of help those companies in general? Sure. In any, any sort of organization, even if you're, if you're an entrepreneur, so it's just yourself, maybe you have a co-founder, but in large organizations, uh, typically the way things work is there are small teams and there's the, what people sometimes call the entrepreneur. So you're in a company, you're probably not independent, but you're part of a, of a project that you're, that you're spearheading, that you're launching, and, and it's like a new project, it's like a, it's like a startup. You get a budget, you get a small team, you get a time to prove yourself, and you need to get traction, you need to get internal or external customers. So regardless if you're, again, if you're independent or if you're in a company, we treat everything like a startup project. And, and so we, we, we start with that, with that concept. Now, for Revlon in particular, they, they had this in, uh, need to train 17,000 people around the world on how to sell their products. So that, you know, we, we had the opportunity to connect with them and, and they wanted us to create a learning management platform that would accommodate that. So we, we, that's what we did for them. We created a multi-language platform that basically could deliver the, the training materials for each of the indiv individual regions where they, where they operate. And each region needed to have different management uh, configurations and different products and services that they would be trained on. And that's the, um, that's the, the gist of, of, that product, of that project. It was a very interesting two years that, uh, because the other thing with large corporations is they tend to move a little bit slower, right? So even though it's, it's, it's a startup for us because they have a limited budget and they have certain constraints, right. they still move a little bit slower. So they need to deploy this and get buying from all the regional offices. So that, that's what we did for them. For 3M, it was a very quick project for marketing and demand generation. So we were able to do some custom integrations, creating some interesting flows and applications for users to be able to redeem codes and get some information uh, for the medical devices in South America. Right. So, so it, was, it, was, um, it was very interesting uh, also. It was, it was a shorter project than Revlon, but nevertheless, very interesting. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. So let, let me ask you this. So what has been some of the challenges when you first launched Vantage IO? What were some of the challenges that you kind of came at you? And also, what do you wish you would have learned before you launched Vantage IO? Sure. Well, I think for, again, for any entrepreneur, the, the biggest challenge is sales, right? So mm -hmm. how do you get your, your first dollar through the door? And, and when you make that transition, if you're, if you're, if you're employed and you need to make, to make that transition, in my case, I was part of that previous startup, the, the social media predictive analytics uh, startup. Right. And when I exited the, the, the company and, and I had to do something else, so I had the opportunity, I, I was uh, offered back my, you know, a, a position, a really, a really good position on a, on, a, on a previous company that I had worked with. And I had that choice and it was probably the, the hardest choice I've ever had to make was either I go back to that comfy, uh, position in a, in, a, in a company where I had all this cloud and all this uh, power basically or do I just go solo and so I, I made a decision to, to just continue my, my entrepreneurial spirit. So the biggest challenge is, is sales and we were lucky enough that I started with my inner circle so I reached out to all the people that I knew, all the people that had worked with me before and asked them and told them, now I'm doing this. I, I, I used to be doing this, uh, this startup. Now I'm using all my skills on all, on all my experience and I'm applying it to helping companies like you. Would you, would you work with me? And some of them said, yes, they, 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 they had worked with, worked with me before and they knew my, my, my abilities and my experience. And that's how we generate the first, the, the, the first few, few clients. Then after that, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle, like, like any other startup. It's, it's just how do you get your, your message across? How do you get yourself to be known? And, and, and that's the biggest struggle, I guess, for any other company and any other entrepreneur is how to get known, how to get attention. 
so so that people will want to work with you. Absolutely. That that is super important for the entrepreneur for sure. Yeah. So I, I see on your website that you also have some case studies, one in particular where you talk uh, for a data warehouse for healthcare. So yes. you know, share some of those findings and also how 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 important has technology become in specifically in the healthcare space over the past couple of years? Wow. We're, we're going to need a different episode for this. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, healthcare, is, uh, healthcare IT is one of my, my, my passions. Okay. So, yes, within the whole entrepreneurship, it's, it, healthcare IT is it's the one that I, that I like the most. And so I had the opportunity to, my, my, let's say, 10 or 12 years of my career had been involved in healthcare IT. And we developed software uh, first to manage the healthcare of uh, yes, EMRs, what they call EMR, electronic medical record management software, mm -hmm. which is just your, you go to your doctor's office and instead of writing everything on paper, they do it on computers. So we created those softwares. Um, we created the software to do the billing and the insurance and everything else. Then, then, I, then I switched companies and I went to this very, very interesting company where we basically took that same concept and we applied it to the maritime industry, to the cruise lines. So we completely revolutionized the industry uh, of cruise line um, uh, in the world because before they, you have to, you have to think about this. W when you go on a cruise, you think about beach and drinks and party, but they, they have anywhere from 700 to 3000 employees. They have 3000 crew members living on board for eight or 10 months at a time. So these people live there, they, 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 they're there for 10 months at a time and they have health, they have health issues. Right, that they have they have anything from problems all the way to wellness programs, and so before they were they were managing all this with papers and emails and and it was very chaotic. And we took uh, we we created software from the ground up, and we put it on the the cruise ships, and they start using a software to manage the healthcare and then communicate via satellite to shore to request permission to give a, a, a treatment or a medication. So that, I mean, that completely, <laughs> it was, it was one of the most interesting projects that, that, that I worked in. And so I think technology and healthcare, of course, it's, it's one of the biggest ones in the next few years. It just moves a little bit slower than everything else because there's all these clinical trials, regulations, compliance, security. Yes, yesterday I was talking with, with, with a prospect and they, they have this application for that, that there is something with healthcare. But the biggest challenge is because there's regulation and compliance, it's not as easy as just hiring any, any junior developer. They need to have that experience to be able to, to work around and navigate through, through that compliance. But, but it's, it's one of the most interesting and fascinating fields that there are. Got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Let's, let's switch our focus just a little bit because I want to ask you something. Uh, that's sure. kind of been going on in the news a little bit. So you're the, the CEO of Vantage IO, right? And so mm -hmm. as the CEO, you have to stay abreast of the business world all around you. Yeah. And so uh, as of this recording, uh, many of us know there's a bit of some trade tensions between the U.S. and China. Now, I know you're a growing tech company, but what are some of those key things you should be vigilant about, you know, between tensions between those two nations? Are you affected as a tech company or is something you definitely need to keep your eye on? Uh, I, at, at least for, for my company and the scope, I mean, we do, we do have a client in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't really affect us. The, okay. the, the issue is consumers need to be aware of this because mm -hmm. probably not a lot of people know about this. A few years, maybe I think it was a year or two years ago, mm -hmm. there is a Chinese company that was manufacturing, um, screens, replacement screens for iPhone. So right. you know, when you track your iPhone, you either go to Apple, pay them $200, or you go to the, to the next door uh, uh, little business and they replace it for 100. Now, when, when, they, when they don't use original Apple components, they using the Chinese uh, manufacturer ones. Right. This company was embedding some sort of chip that had some software in it, and it was recording all your keystrokes. It was, record, it was basically like a Trojan horse on your screen. Mm. And so you can imagine that, I mean, if you, you can protect everything, you can change your password, you can do everything you want, but if your screen is bugged, then you know everything goes out the window. Right, and so, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, right? Yeah, so yeah, there, there's, all this, there's all this power to make us, to, to make good, but some people are gonna find a way to, 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 to do evil with it. 
So I think, yeah, the, it's not going to affect us for now, except maybe, you know, higher steel prices and, and, and imports from China at this point. Right. I think, um, I think, yeah, I don't want to get political, but it's probably just, it's a, it's a negotiation strategy by the government to, to improve or, or, or trade deficit with them. Hopefully it doesn't backfire, but <laughs> um, right. as it didn't, it didn't happen the last year, but now, you know, they're pushing a little, they're doubling down. So, <laughs> Hopefully, gotcha. it doesn't backfire. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, and, and I wasn't asking that question to be political, but it was just a, a simple <laughs> business question. You know, something yeah. that is going on for sure. But I appreciate you sharing your your uh, vantage point and your and what you think about it for sure. So, but let's lighten it up a little bit. So, <laughs> I, I I'm on the, I'm on your Twitter page, right? And I see uh, your profile picture, and like like a headphones, almost like you're are you are you piloting something? What's going on there? <laughs> That was that was my wife's uh, my first birthday present by my wife. Okay. Um, I think we were married then. I think we were, we were just. Um, I think we were engaged back then. Gotcha. So she took me. Uh, she's she's very much like that. She likes to make pre- prepare surprises and gifts with a lot of thought into it. Okay. So she took me by surprise to Bayside down here in Miami. There's there's a play where there's there's a bay, and I didn't know where we we're going. And she just you know we got on a, on a little boat. The boat took us to a platform, and there was a helicopter. Oh wow! <laughs> and so it was a helicopter tour of Miami and 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 different areas, and it was it was just great. I, I love flying. I I never had the opportunity to become a pilot or or anything like that, but I, okay. I I always had a passion for for flying, and so it was it was amazing. So I was she was sitting behind me. I don't know if, if it's visible in that. Yeah, picture. I can see. I can see. Yeah, her. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, she was she was smiling behind that. The pilot was trying to like make a turn, and she was like, "No, stop." Because you know it tilts a little bit, and so she 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 got scared. But uh, yeah, that's that's where the picture is. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So let me ask you this: a quick follow up. How how instrumental has your wife been to you on your path to entrepreneurship? Because like you know, uh, being an entrepreneur can be kind of lonely at sometimes. So how how important has your wife been on your path? Oh, uh, there's yeah. I mean, there's no no way to explain it. Um, gotcha. You you need to have that that support and that companionship and that partnership that, that you develop with, with the right person to, to be able to pursue this. Because, you know, as I said, three years ago when, when I exited my, my startup and, and my previous employer asked me and he said, would you like to come back and get the same position that you had before you left and, and do all these great things? And, and I have to go and ask her, hey, what do you think about all this steady and, and, and nice little things? Or we go this risky and rocky road and and she's like do whatever makes you happier and and not just like you know not just like bl- blindly saying that but she truly meant it so definitely uh at every stage of her of her marriage she's extremely supportive and it has helped us uh go through this it's it's a it's a very difficult road it's it, entrepreneurship it doesn't it, it doesn't come easy all everybody says this about you know you always see everybody smiling and everything just because right. Then when they're getting the, the, their awards or they're saying they're, they're the billion dollar company, but you don't see the, the day-to-day struggles that they had to endure or how many ideas failed before that one hit. And so you, you don't see that, that road, that, that, that difficult path to, to get to that, to that successful level. So definitely you, you need the right companion. Got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. So Sammy, I want to play a game with you, man. And I hope you're, you're willing to indulge me here a little bit. So the, the name of the game is called One Has to Go, okay? Okay. So let me explain the rules of the game. So basically, I'm going to give you four names, right? And one of these people you have to pick to, to go. But not only do they go, but them and all of their work goes with them, like as if it never existed, okay? Okay. So I'm going to give you four names. You ready? All right. So sure. the four names I'm going to give you is Jack Dorsey. Okay. Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, or Bill Gates? Which one has to go? Okay. Uh, I don't want to sound... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I haven't used a Windows computer in, in like 15 years. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very tempted to, to get rid of, of, of Bill Gates. Oh, wow. Why, why Bill Gates? Is, is, is that... So so no so Microsoft never existed and everything he's done just goes away. You're okay with that? There's no no, no. There, there's no way there's no way to pick the everything everything that these four guys have done 
has dramatically changed our lives in ways that you, you can't imagine. Pro probably, actually, Bill Gates is probably one of the ones that, that most, that had the biggest impact in everybody's life. Right. The fact that I haven't used a computer is just because I switched to Mac and I, and I just love Apple products. But, uh, but I started off my career with, uh, you know, I started off when I was very young with, with a Windows computer. But, but beyond that, I think everybody had their own contribution. So, um, you know, what, what would the world be without Twitter? Or <laughs> what would the world be without probably Elon Musk? If we have to, like, definitely have to pick one. Okay. Uh, I think if Elon Musk hadn't come uh, into existence, there would have been somebody else. Or uh, th There's already some some variances of it, right? There's, there's, okay. uh, in terms of electric cars, there's, there's a lot of companies pushing forward prior to him and after him, and they'll, they'll keep on coming and improving. And I think that also the, the space exploration. So Bezos is doing it and other companies or the private companies are doing it. So if I had to really pick one would be him, Elon Musk. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So no, no Tesla, no SpaceX. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Don't hold me for a second one because it's <laughs> I, I can't gotcha. pick one. Fair <laughs> enough. Appreciate that for sure. So Samuel, I think all entrepreneurs have a superpower. What's yours and why, man? I think I have the ability to to take any any sort of software, not so any sort of problem, and figure out a way to put it into software terms. So a lot of people get stuck in, in some part of that. Um, typically, they say engineers only use their left brain. Uh, in my case, I, I feel that probably my superpower is, is I use both sides of, of my brain. So I have my engineering and my logical side and, and everything has to do with, with the system. But I also understand the business perspective, the user needs, the marketing needs, and, and how that all of that plays into the success of a, of a product. So I think that that's my superpower is just being able to use both sides of the brain and figuring out everything from start to finish, not just one side of the equation or the other. That is awesome. That's an awesome superpower for sure. Yeah. So before I ask you the last question, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the startup life podcast powered by the bench podcast network. You great. You gave great value and immense content today from everything from, you know, app development to how you run your company and everything in between. So I appreciate you for sharing all of that for sure. So this last Thank question, you. no worries, no worries. Uh, so this last question, I'm actually going to turn the microphone over to you because Samuel, look, there's an entrepreneur out there who's, who's, they're feeling stuck. They feel stuck in their business. They don't know a way forward or they're afraid to start their company. Give them some words of motivation to tell them to keep moving forward. Sure. Listen, it's not the easiest decision I've made, but, but I know in the long run, it's, it, it was the best one that, that I, that I could have made. So Whatever you are, if you're, if you're probably most, of, I, I guess most of people have this issue is, is they're, they're employed, they're, they're comfortable or, or barely, barely making enough to, to, to live. And then how are they going to save enough? How are they going to save six to 12 months to jump off and, and start their own projects? So keep in mind that there's always a way there, the fact that you don't have the, 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 the funds saved or that you don't have access to an investor right now doesn't make that doesn't mean that you can't find a way to fund your your project doesn't mean that you need six months or 12 months to live off it, you know there's so many ways there's always a way out and there's always there's always a way to make things happen so you have to make things happen and don't give excuses don't do anything you know all those negative things just keep pushing forward make sure that your idea is valid make sure that you're not just like jumping on the first shiny thing that, 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 that somebody told you about or that you think about, make, make sure you do your research, make sure you, you understand your, your market. Uh, just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean that you cannot be the next one and, and the better one and the successful one. And just think about uh, all those things that, that are gonna change your life, not in the next year, three or five years, but when you're, when you're 50 years down the road and you look back and you realize that you actually changed something. And, Take this with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean maybe leaving your job. Maybe you can make a difference being an entrepreneurship, an entrepreneur. So if you're working for a large company or a small company and you can make a huge difference there, that's, that's still worth it. It's, it's extremely worthy. So don't think that you just need to go on your own and do your own stuff. The, some of the, the most interesting stories that, that I've heard about are typically, you know, somehow they pair up with their employers or they pair up with somebody else inside and they grew that into into something interesting so 
don't give up. Just don't don't make any harsh decisions and keep moving forward. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. And that's going to wrap up this session of the Startup Life. Samuel, did you enjoy being on the show, my man? I did. Yes. Thank you so much. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. I have Startup Nation. So here's my final take. Startup Nation, on your path to entrepreneurship, it's very important to just go for it. Just build on your idea. And Samuel talks about that in this episode, which I really love. You're going to have these moments where you're going to be cautious. You're going to have these moments to where... You, you want to, you know, make sure you got all your ducks in a row. And I get it. I, I am that person even to this day from time to time. But Startup Nation, when you're looking for that investment, when you're looking to scale your company or grow your business, sometimes you have to just build it out. Sometimes you just have to go. And Samuel brings that up in this episode and he brings that up as he walks on his path of entrepreneurship if you want to let us know what you think about the show have an idea for a show topic or like to advertise on our show please send us a message on the startup life podcast facebook page and while you are there like and follow our page as well it's a way for us to engage with you startup nation and really grow our community the link is here in the show notes subscribe to the show as can be now be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or whatever your favorite platform to get your podcast on. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. Also, don't forget to sign up for the Startup Life All Access Pass to get exclusive content. This is exclusively on the Bench Podcast Network's Patreon page. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life. The Startup Life. What up, Startup Nation? You're looking for that extra content, aren't you? Hmm, I guess you can have some this week. Here you go. We've got a number of white papers that go into depth into different topics that uh, you can take that and, and learn it. And, and again, talk about it, it is about learning and growing, but it's also about implementation. So take take those white papers, take those insights, and, and dig into them to say, okay, how can I make this work in my business? How do I, how do I take this knowledge and act on it? It's, I, I love it when people read, I love it when people show their libraries, but it's all about implementation. And that's a big part of using those free resources to truly act on it, refer back to it and, and make it happen. So Startup Nation, we go from South Florida all the way to the Midwest in Iowa, and we talk to Monty Wyatt the founder and CEO of addingzeros.com and the author of Pulling Profits Out of a Hat. So if you want to get that content as soon as it's available, go ahead and subscribe to the Startup Life Podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms. So that way, when that episode with Monty is available, it'll be right there waiting for you. But until then, Startup Nation, get out of here. You got a company to grow.